Welcome to A2A Conversations, an ongoing discussion about turning adversity into advocacy. Join us as we explore the power of purpose, service, and empathy, and the resilience we build when helping ourselves by helping others. Now here's our host, A2A founder, Jeff Bell. Hi there, and welcome to the very first episode of A2A Conversations. We're excited about launching this new series of video chats, and we appreciate your taking the time to watch. In the coming weeks and months, we'll be sharing intimate conversations with a variety of researchers, authors, and adversity-driven advocates, each in his or her own way, an expert in the mechanics of turning adversity into advocacy. For this first episode, we thought it was only appropriate that we check in with someone who has been with A2A since the beginning of our journey, some 10 years ago now. Dr. Stephen Hinshaw is not only a world-renowned psychologist, professor, and author, he's also a founding member of our A2A Leadership Council. Dr. Hinshaw is currently with both the Psychology Department at UC Berkeley and the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at UC San Francisco. He is the author of a powerful memoir called Another Kind of Madness, and in it he describes growing up with a father battling mental illness and how that informed his career path and the work that he's doing. We started our conversation by asking him to describe that journey. So it's a, a long story across multiple generations of both a lot of pride and achievement in our family and lots of mental illness in various forms. My dad, who was a philosopher, sort of started his journey into mental illness at the age of 16 when in Southern California, he was the fourth of, of six boys in this family. His father was a national and international prohibition leader, was convinced in the mid thirties that he was the sole person on earth destined to fight Hitler and Mussolini and the Nazis and fascists. He was undergoing what we now know was a fast rising episode of very severe mania. Uh, no one knew it at the time when he was diagnosed, it was with chronic schizophrenia showing how little we knew about serious mental illness back a couple of generations ago. And on one night in September of 1936, with voices crowding his head, he walked back after having been up all night wandering the streets down in Pasadena where he grew up, climbed to the roof of his house and made a leap thinking he could fly, his arms had become wings, to send a message to the free world's leaders to stop Hitler and, and the fascists. His flight lasted a second. He crashed, he had a concussion, he broke his left wrist, was rushed to the hospital, set, spent six months on a back ward of a county hospital public facility in Southern California, recovered spontaneously, went on to Stanford and Princeton. He worked with Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein at Princeton, fabulous career interrupted many times by these precipitous, what we now call mixed episodes, combinations of severe mania with depression and despair. When I was little, dad was my go-to philosophy professor. My sister and I visited his office in University Hall at Ohio State, but he would be gone for three months, six months, or at one point a year at a time with no warning. We never knew where he was. No one was allowed to talk about it. His lead doctor, at OSU told him and my mother that if my sister and I ever learned of his mental illness, we'd be permanently destroyed. So the doctor's orders were never talk about. So what do kids do when stuff like this happens? Well, I guess you could believe the world's a pretty awful, cruel place, or you could believe it's your fault. Well, it's not my sister's fault or my fault, but at least it gives a semblance of control. But the control comes at a cost of anxiety, depression, and internalization. So I knew pretty early on, I wanted to go into medicine or psychology. Dad came out of the closet, so to speak, when I was a freshman in college, returned to Columbus for my first spring break. And lo and behold, he realized I wasn't a child anymore. He wasn't defying the doctor's orders. So he told me about his episodes and his life, which motivated me to become a clinical psychologist and study not only child and adolescent psychopathology and treatments, but also to fight the stigma that still clings to mental illness. 
So that was your major driver in, in publishing the story, Steve, was to Absolutely. do what you can to break yeah. down some of the stigma out there. Um, I want to talk about stigma vis-a-vis -vis these principles of purpose and service. Yeah. Um, I, I know from my own journey that when we share our stories, we help break down stigma. It's what you've done in your book. It's what so many of us in A2A have done over the years or have attempted to do. But I also know that we derive something personally from that process as well. And for me, it's a sense of purpose. Can you speak to that? I have a purpose in life I have felt since I was quite young and then reinforced when I had just turned 18 when dad opened up to me to figure out what goes right in development and what can go awry. And I'm committed to the science of understanding genetic roots, family roots, cultural and school-based roots of, of mental disorders. But I'm also committed over the years to storytelling. All the scientific facts in the world can help raise literacy. And the American public knows tons more about mental disorders than a generation or two ago. But attitudes, except for one study just published a month ago that's starting to show a sea change, attitudes have hardly budged. In fact, today, three times more Americans, if they hear the term mental disorder, mental illness, inevitably think of dangerousness and violence compared to the 1950s and 60s. Knowledge is up, but knowledge can just reinforce stereotypes unless it comes with humanization, purpose, commitment, and telling the world that, and this is true of the disability rights movement, this is true of the women's movement, black power, gay pride, for mental health and mental illness, I think we're at a moment where acceptance may be around the corner far more than it ever has been. And I attribute a lot of that to young people. We do a lot of work through various organizations, including Bring Change to Mind right here in San Francisco with high school kids and now even piloting groups in middle schools where the kids themselves through evidence-based means choose their own and design their own curriculum to fight the stigma. And I think as these kids grow up, we're going to have a, a cohort replacement, so to speak, and a sea change. So storytelling, of course, is, is a wonderful form of service. It, it builds our purpose, as you've just alluded to there. Um, in your book, The Triple Bind, Saving Our Teenage Girls from Today's Pressures, uh, as I recall, you, you specifically advise girls to focus less on themselves at, at challenging times and to find a wider sense of purpose, oftentimes through volunteering. Um, what, what, what are the mechanics of, of all that from a psychology standpoint? So the premise of the triple bind, written now 12 years ago, every premise in it has come truer, sadly, than I would have hoped in terms of rising suicide rates and self-injury rates, depression and anxiety, especially in teen girls. The premise is that girls are pegged with this sort of triple whammy. You've got to be compliant and nurturant or you're not kind of a real girl, you're now exceedingly competitive academically outpacing uh, boys, uh, athletically, athletic scholarships. But you have to do it if you're a girl, effortlessly and in a very sexualized way. Physically and psychologically impossible to pull off that triple bind. Well, people say boys' culture is tanking a bit, but let's face it, if a boy is doing well academically, athletically, but is also kind and nurturant, we say, what a guy, he's superhuman. But if a girl fails to do that, we, we say, what's the matter with her? So this focus on being nurturing, being competitive, being hot looking and effortless, it's impossible to do. It's though, so the mirror is focusing right back on the self. There's many antidotes, better sleep, uh, less, bone crushing homework during the pandemic, everyone's finding his or her own sense of purpose, but especially community service, realizing what work there needs to be done on so many fronts in the world can help one get out of this kind of self-perpetuating vicious cycle of self-reference and self-focus. You know, it's interesting, you mentioned the pandemic, and it seems like if there is a silver lining, and it's hard to find one sometimes, yeah. um, it's that our collective sense of empathy seems to be building. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing from so many people in my own world that they, they've come to understand certain things about my own journey and challenges with anxiety that they might not have otherwise understood. Yeah. Um, 
what what are your own thoughts in terms of of how empathy is and is not being uh, nurtured through this pandemic process? So my hope, and is it going to come true? Uh, time will tell as we go through the surges and uh, ebbs and flows of the pandemic. But that all of us have experienced more isolation. All of us have experienced loss. The 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 ruining of what might have been had we seen the relative whom we just haven't been able to see or read about the worldwide effects of the pandemic, that we might all consider more at an emotional and a cognitive level just how much social bonds mean to us, how important it is to relish the contacts we have, and just maybe, as you so aptly pointed out a second ago, develop more empathy and less stigma for those whose base levels of anxiety, depression, sometimes despair, the, the, the tide has flowed so much with the pandemic that we're all experiencing that in some degree, of course, some more than others, if you've got the genes or you've got early trauma and other vulnerabilities, but that just maybe stigma is going to reduce as we become more aware of the purpose we have, the service we need to do, and that we're all humans in the same boat together. Let's talk a little bit about the science of all of this. You were instrumental in starting the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley. Um, and this is a wonderful think tank that looks at the, the, the scientific evidence behind a meaningful life. Um, I imagine because you and your colleagues were so ahead of the time that that might have been perceived as quote unquote soft science when you first launched the project. Right. Um, where is that science in the evolution within the scientific community? Is it still deemed that way or is it becoming more accepted as, look, this stuff really is making a difference? I think it's becoming more mainstream every day and not in the kind of Pollyanna way that you maybe were alluding to. Well, you feel good. Look at all the despair and misery in the world. You also mentioned the term evolution, so I'll take on another meaning of that. How did we make it to eight and a half billion strong humans on this planet? We're a very social species. Now, if we're ultra social all the time, we may get exploited, which may be some of the naturally selected roots of racial prejudice or mental illness stigma. Keep away from somebody who's contagious. Speaking about contagion, what about the pandemic? Sure. How many masks do you wear, et cetera, et cetera. What we need to do is build the sense that we're all in this together as fellow humans, in groups and out groups. That might have been necessary for our survival when we were small bands of hunter-gatherers or in our agricultural communities being attacked. But if we can expand our in-group to a much wider community, in fact, to all of humanity, then it's not us versus them. It's that we're all in this together during a pandemic, through times of joy, through times of loss. And I, I will you know, make what may seem like a bold statement, but it's true. If we can't do this, we're not gonna survive as a species because we're in a crowded planet. Uh, climate change is on everybody's mind, sea levels rising, air pollution, which of course is one of the contributing factors to psychopathology among many others as well. If we don't figure out ways to work together to solve these problems, uh, I don't think our future is very bright, but I remain optimistic. So, so let's talk about where some of that research is going. What, what yes. gives you hope in terms of what you're seeing, what you're participating in yourself, um, what is happening at Cal and UCSF where you work um, in, in terms of exploring some of these principles, resilience, uh, science and compassion and service and purpose. So one theme here among many is it's team science. No one scientist toiling at the bench is gonna be able to solve climate change, compassion, the roots of mental disorder, what is resilience and how do we foster it? It's gonna take people doing a biochemistry and genetic and genomic work, people doing community psychology and psychiatry, people working in schools, people shaping national policy. And it's very exciting to see teams form. It's very exciting these days to see the formerly separate campuses of UCSF, the great health sciences campus, and UC Berkeley, the liberal arts set of buildings on the hill with the Campanile coming together in, in unique ways. The brain is the most complicated thing we've ever discovered in the known universe. 
How does it shape itself? How does it prune? How do these connections form? It's through social interactions and bonds and early stimulation and the avoidance of traumatic experience. The mind and brain, the body and mind, the old age old philosophical question, the mind body problem, they're all one at some level and they become one through a sense of purpose and dedication and commitment. If we all live selfish lives, it's not going to be good for us in terms of our development, and it's certainly not going to be good for the survival of our species. So in terms of the science, and I think you've just alluded to this, there is this coming together of the physical and the psychological, and it's safe to extrapolate that there are physiological benefits to these principles that we're talking about beyond the psychological ones? So let's just take a, a, a simple but very important example. Every study done on every species known to humankind shows that exercise and activity is good for not only the body, but the brain and mind, Sure, right? Can help fend off uh, neurodevelopmental disorders, can be an antidote in part to ADHD and depression and, and, and many conditions like this. When we realize how multidisciplinary we need to be, and when we realize that optimism, not just pessimism and illness, but optimism and hope and resilience are an equal part of the equation, everybody benefits. And the former views of this is kind of Pollyanna science may help us rethink how the brain develops and rethink how members of our species can come together and bond together for the common good. Mm -hmm. I want to wrap this up by bringing it sort of full circle back to where we started with A2A 10 years ago now, believe it or not, it's been 10 years. Yeah. And, and that is trying to instill in as many people as we can, the value of turning adversity into advocacy, taking personal challenges and, and through them, using our empathy to be of service to other people and developing that sense of purpose. Speak, if you would, directly to somebody right now who thinks that he or she is not able to do that because they haven't had some fantastic journey of, of through adversity, whatever the case might be. They're afraid of telling their story. Um, they, they don't know how to start. Where would you, where would you point that person? How would you get them going? So I'm going to give uh, an example that I talked about in another kind of madness and mention a lot in, in talks I give, which is the example of cancer. Cancer is a cause today, breast cancer in women, prostate cancer in, in men, two, two of the most prevalent uh, forms. What was cancer thought to be back in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s? A disease you brought upon yourself because you'd lost the will to live. Mm. Poor moral fiber. If, you're, if your great aunt, Jeff, or if, if my grandpa died of cancer back then, would we ever put that in the obituary? Mm. No, died of natural causes, died of an unknown illness because it was so stigmatized. Sticky. Today, a couple of generations later, cancer is a cause. The NFL behemoths wear pink knee socks one game every fall to support breast cancer research. What color do the NFL behemoths wear to support mental health research? Uh, well, we're not there yet, right? It's not as much of a cause because it's still so stigmatized. I think that it's the telling of stories. Women speaking up about this formerly stigmatized illness and support groups and pushing for greater funding. If we did the same for mental health, then the National Institute of Mental Health would have as much funding per capita as the National Cancer Institute does. It comes back to changes in policy at a sort of global legislative level, Americans with Disabilities Act, for example. But I think much of this stems from humanization, storytelling, and making sure that everyone's story is important. It, you know, a lot of celebrities are coming out about mental health issues. That's great. Sure. Right. But then I guess um, if you're John Nash, the uh, uh, economist and game theorist of a beautiful mind. I, I guess if you have schizophrenia, you either win the Nobel Prize or you're under a freeway overpass, not smelling very good. It's the everyday triumphs, many tragedies, uh, many joys. When stories are told like this, no one can ignore the issue. Dr. Hinshaw, thanks so much for being first, our, our first guest on the new A2A Conversations podcast, but even more for all your support over 10 years. We really appreciate everything you've done to help guide us and move us in the right direction. 
Well, A to A is one of a growing number of heartfelt yet business savvy enterprises, nonprofits that know it's going to take a lot of people coming together to change the world in healthy ways. So more power to you. Happy 10th anniversary and glad to be uh, the first guest for this new series. Thank you. And here's to the next 10 years. That's right. You've been watching A2A Conversations, a presentation of the nonprofit A2A Alliance. Guest views and opinions expressed in this production are those of the guests and do not necessarily reflect those of A2A, its advocates, advisors, or partners. To watch more of our A2A Conversations, please visit us online at a2aalliance.org.